Hello, my name is Amit Pellet. I'm a cellist, performer, and a professor uh, of cello at uh, Johns Hopkins University, the Peabody Institute. And uh, I would like today, along with Pablo, which is my cello these days, to introduce to you um, a general uh, sort of outlook on my approach to the basic language of cello playing. This is something that I've been uh, dealing with a lot myself as a performer and I've enjoyed tremendously sharing it with my own students through the years and I've came up um, with sort of a, a cello emojis, uh, sort of cartoon characters that allows me to speak to my students in a sort of what we call a cello language that really clarifies to them and to me also as a, as a performer how to approach the instrument so the instrument becomes part of our body and we don't have to change anything in order to play it. So we're going to start with what we call the seven cello commandments. There are ten commandments for the humans, there are seven for our <laughs> cello studio. And the seven commandment is basically when you draw seven lines, you can create a house. So we call it the house. Every house has four fundamentals. Fundamentals are um, one, two, three, four. On top of them, there's the roof. So that creates the seven lines. What are those four fundamentals that allows us humans to become free at all time? So when we, let's say, when we sit and eat, or when we talk on the phone, what do we do physically? What is mutual for us uh, movement-wise when we do those basic routine um, movements during the day? So what I find is that there are four of them. One is breathing. We always breathe, otherwise we would die. So we exhale and inhale air at all time. That's number one, to be able while you're playing to inhale and exhale the, the air. That's number one, really important. If there's any given moment in the repertoire when you play a note on the cello and you're not able to do it freely, something is wrong. Number two, what we call in my studio bouncing lower back. When we sit, let's say, and watch TV, when we sit and eat, when we talk to our friends, we hardly ever, if at all, sit and put our lower back inside and sit straight like this. This is really uncomfortable. Um, yet, when we play the cello, a lot of us do that. So I want to show you what happens if I still do the breathing, which is one of the four fundamentals of the house. I still breathe in and out, but my lower back is pushed inside. Now listen to my sound when I bounce my lower back. You hear the difference between what I call a one-dimensional sound, e or uh, it's exactly like singers. When singers approach the note by lifting the body up or planting the body down, accepting the note inside the body. T E. Same with the cello. So now we have two fundamentals. Breathing and bouncing lower back. Ah, that feels much better. Third element of the seven commandments is body movement. Now let's imagine, and we will go back to it a lot during this presentation, let's imagine that we don't play the cello. Let's imagine that we're having now lunch or dinner or breakfast. And I'm sitting here and a friend of mine sits right on my right side. And the butter is right here. And they ask me, Amit, can you pass the butter? I don't even think about it. I take the butter, I pass it to them. Subconsciously what I do, I tilt my weight towards the right side of my body and I just follow my hand. Yeah? This is a very um, natural movement. Now, if I hate that person, I do this like, go to hell, but usually I don't. Usually you like somebody, you do this. So your body follows through the motion. Now, when we play the cello, instead of taking a butter and passing it to your friend, you take the bow and you draw a down bow. What's the difference between the two? Nothing. The problem is that a lot of us, when we play the cello, we do this motion. We resist instead of follow. So if we follow through towards the end of the bow, we create a very natural movement. And that's what we call body movement. We'll get into it more when we get into the emojis, the actual emojis. 
But as a fundamental, we have the number three fundamental in our house, building the house. We have breathing, we have bouncing lower back, and we have body movement. Now, number four, and again, I have to say that those four fundamentals should be reached on every single note that we play on the cello. I strongly believe that if we play one note and one of the fundamentals is not there, that note will be squeaky, that note will be tight, we will not be able to really express our emotions with it. So, number four is elbows dropping down. Now, why do I say that? Because a lot of people, when they play the cello, they do this, what I call the bird. They're flying a bird. And what's interesting is that I started discovering it when I looked at my students while they're listening to me talk. And I realized that there's really three postures of the body of my students listening to me talking. One of them is what I do right now, is your palm of your hands on your elbows. Fine, you listen to your teacher talk, you listen to anybody talk. Number two, they will do this. Put the hand in the fourth position, hanging on the cello. Very common. Number three, I see some students doing this when I talk to them. So, okay, fine. Now, in many years of teaching and exchanging ideas with colleagues, I've never seen a student or a colleague in a quartet or a trio listening to me or to somebody else talking like this or like this. Like, sure, fine, okay, I'll do it, no problem. Or, no, that just doesn't happen. At the same time, I've never seen anybody drink a glass of water, a glass of wine, a glass of juice like this. Lifting up the elbow, collapsing the wrist. I've never seen that, that's not com comfortable. Have you ever seen somebody talk on the phone like this? Just doesn't happen. So why do we play the cello like this? There are so many cellists, students, professionals, that express their emotions with what I think are wrong motion. One of that wrong motions is to lift your elbow up. You express a musical idea, for instance, and you create tension in the sound where if you understand the nature of your body, you want to drop your elbow down as if you're holding your iPhone, or as if you're holding a glass and drink. So when you play, you don't express your emotion by lifting the elbow. So number four is elbow. Now that goes back to the bow as well. This is left hand and right hand. If we play a note, and we get to the tip, many people do this, because they express kind of an emotion or discomfort sometimes when they shift with lifting the elbows. So those four fundamentals, breathing, bouncing lower back, body movements, and elbows, are the fundamentals of us, of our cello house. Now, if we have those four fundamentals, we can start dealing with the roof. The roof of the house is sense of pulse, quality of sound, and intonation. That creates a house. If a performer playing the cello can achieve that comfort zone with those four fundamentals, building on top of it beautiful sound by bouncing your lower back, dropping your elbows, body movement, and breathing. If you can achieve that warmth, that beauty, that velvety sound, you can start dealing with quality, what kind of quality of sound you want, with what is the sense of pulse in the piece I play, and always number one with good intonation. Now, that creates a house, as you can see on the screen. That house can be decorated any way you want, not me. <clears throat> and that's the fun of it, that's the music. That's not about cello playing, that's about delivering what the composer wanted. You can put in a house, a kitchen, you can put in a house, TV room, whatever you want, that's musical decision. But that house is non-negotiable, I believe. So now, when we achieve that house, four fundamentals and three lines on the top, we can start dealing with our cello emojis. <clears throat> These emojis take care of left hand, right hand, and general body, which means general body, both two hands and the body movement. Naturally, after moving from the house into the emojis, I would like to start by talking about body posture. So the next four emojis are, are going to help you to achieve those four fundamentals. We are now going into more details. Number one is the tiger. 
Why is a tiger? I love watching National Geographic. And I, when I watch that channel, I love watching those tigers just running, 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 and then jumping on their food and killing it. It's just beauty of nature. And when you look at that tiger before jumping, the tiger would never lean backward. Will never be like, sure, life is good, now let's jump. They will always lean forward, be alert, and get ready to go. Now, I find that this posture, physically and mentally, is the basic posture of us musicians when we want to create. First and foremost, when we are physically alert, we can decide what we want to do. Do we want more body movement? Do we want more bouncing lower back? Do we want more elbows control? Do we want to breathe more? Do we want all of them together? If you sit laying back, it's much harder to do it than if you sit laying forward. Or like the great Janos Starker used to say, if you're a soloist of an orchestra and you play your concerto and then there's fire backstage, you'll be the first one to stand up and walk. And this ability to stand up in any given second and walk, meaning you're in a productive mode, is extremely important for playing the cello. So that's the tiger. We sit and when we play, we are always alert physically. We lean forward a little bit and we are ready to go. We are ready to go physically for the four fundamentals. We are ready to go mentally or musically to look at the conductor, listen to the concertmeister, adjusting to our pianist, communicate with our public, all those things together. That's a tiger. Number two is the tree. And I started thinking about a tree once I was in Hawaii one, for a festival and I played in Maui. It's a gorgeous place and I was located in a beautiful hotel looking at the ocean. Now in front, between my balcony and the ocean was a palm tree. And every morning I would sit out and have, having my coffee and you know, a lot of wind, it's beautiful, it's warm but it's windy. And I see that palm tree and something I've never seen before, the tree actually goes down almost to the ground and then comes up. So the tree becomes flexible to the wind in order to survive. And then I started thinking about us cellists, you know, what do we have to be flexible to? When we, let's say when we're a baseball player, we take the baseball and we want to throw it really far. We don't even think about it, but the second half of our body is related to that motion. When we move the butter, as I said before, to somebody, our body is reacting to it. Earth is reacting to the sun. Moon is reacting to Earth. Everything has a physical reaction. What do we need to react to when we play the cello? There's one movement that we have to do, it's non-negotiable, it's moving the bow. So the more we move the bow, let's call it wind, the more wind we have, the more our body, which I that, at that point decided will be a tree. In that moment I decided that that tree, instead of resisting it, I will become flexible to it. Okay, so what does a tree do when it, 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 get, it gets hit by wind? First, first of all, it freaks out, it resists it, but then it starts following it, so it doesn't break. Okay, and that's what we do with the bow. When we move the bow, when we start moving the bow, our body, let's call it from our sitting bones up to here, that's going to be the trunk of the tree, okay? Our feet, that's going to be the roots, it's non-negotiable, it's not going to go off the ground. As you know, many of us cellists, we express our emotions by lifting the roots. Many cellists will play and they would lift the roots and then they'll forget to put them down. And the whole performance are on their tippy toes. Now that's very hard for your body. You cannot be productive when you do that. So the roots are planted to the ground. It's non-negotiable. Now the trunk of the tree from your sitting bones up, that's when it becomes interesting and fun. First, we're going to start by resisting the movement of the wind, the bow. So, if I play the beginning of the bow on a down bow, the trunk of the tree is going to go against the direction of the wind. But as I feel the resistance starting to break me, I follow the wind. Follow. Resist. Follow. Resist. Follow. And I become flexible to the one movement that I have to do as a cellist, and it's to move the bow. That's the tree. So our tree is going to move, for instance, if you play Elgar Concerto's fourth movement, there's a lot of movement. You start by going against. Against. Follow. 
against follow now against against follow again follow against 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 follow against 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 now i go back home ah and it feels really natural. Now, it doesn't have to be scientifically like what I just did. I mean, eventually when it becomes part of your blood system, you become like a tree and this become like wind. It's just nature. You resist and follow the direction of the bow just because you feel that it's not comfortable not to do one of the two. And that's really a wonderful feeling. So that's a tree. We had the tiger, which is how we sit and approach our target, which is music or physically the cello. Number two, we have the tree which is our body, we treat our body as a tree. Roots planted to the ground, trunk of the tree flexible to the wind, which is our bow arm. Number three is what I call the dinner posture. Dinner posture, I admire Daniel Barenboim. Daniel Barenboim is a great, one of the greatest pianists of all time, one of the greatest conductors. I admire him, I adore him. I don't know him personally, but I love watching him play and conduct. Part of my uh, admiration to him was to read his autobiography, which is really wonderful and I highly recommend it. Um, there's a chapter there about his upbringing in Argentina as a pianist. And he talks very shortly, very briefly, about his one and only piano technique lesson, which was with his father when he was five years old. So I'm reading it casually, and then he says something very interesting. He says, my father told me to sit in front of the piano as if, I'm going to put my cello down, to sit in front of the piano as if I'm eating dinner comfortably, to put my hands on the piano as if I'm holding my fork and knife, and to eat or to play. That's it. That was my, that was my piano technique lesson forever. One and only one. And I'm reading it and I said, wow, well, he was, he's a genius, you know, he doesn't need technique lessons. But then I think about it, dinner posture, what does that mean? You know, I'm a cellist, I'm not a pianist, so it cannot be fork and knife. But what if I use the same fork as an as a analogy to my bow, and then instead of a knife, I'm going to use my hand as holding a glass. So I've, I'm starting to play with it. I'm, I'm taking my cello away. This is not a cello lesson. I'm thinking, how would I sit and eat comfortably, let's say, and watch TV, God forbid me. Yeah? Sit, have my plate here and let's say I have a steak, or you're a vegetarian, you have pasta, and you're eating your dinner. If you're under 21, you have water. If you're me, you have wine, and you sit there and you eat your dinner. And you stick your fork into the steak and eat. And then I started looking at my fork. Okay, let's analyze it. Dinner posture. So how do I hold my fork and feel comfortable? Forget about cello now. I hold my fork and I watch TV. Then I start looking at my elbow. Yes, my elbow back to the house the four fundamentals, my elbow is lower than the palm of my hand. That's comfortable. Again, not connecting it to cello yet. My wrist is always broken a little bit upward, like a bump. There's a little bump here. Very gentle one. It's not straight. It's not breaking downwards. It's just hanging. I'm hanging with my hand. And my fingers are holding the fork. Now, let's imagine that instead of a fork, it's a bow. So I'm just holding the bow. Okay, now, I take the glass of wine, and I have a zip of it, and then I don't put it down because I'm so much into that football game, and I, I just can't stop. So I'm drinking and I'm holding it, and I say, wait, this is a dinner posture, wait. Okay, so can I put the cello into this posture? Let's see. Take the cello, and I sit like a tiger, I'm ready to go. I feel like a tree, I'm flexible. Now I'm going to hold my fork, but instead of a fork, I'm going to hold my bow. And I find out that holding a fork is approximately the frog. I mean, we never eat like this or like this. We eat here. That's comfortable. So let's say frog. Now, where's a glass of wine? I'm drinking the wine, then I put it down. And it's around the fourth position. And I look at it and I say, you know what? Actually, I always felt that playing in the frog and the fourth position is the most comfortable way to play. Of course, we can't do it always, but we wish it would be. Like if I ask a student, what is the most comfortable note on the cello for you to play? 90% of the time they'll say B flat, second finger on D string. Sometimes they'll say D, A, C. You know, it's around this area. 
So I'm thinking to myself, wait, I think I discovered for myself, for the first time in my life, after I, that was after I finished studying the cello actually with wonderful cellists, I found out what it means to be in a dinner posture mode. And then I talked to my friends, colleagues on, in other instruments. Can it be the same for violin, dinner posture? Can it be the same, of course, we know for pianists, for clarinetists, for flutists, for conductor, for engineering, working on a computer. The dinner posture is human posture. And I realized that instead of fighting it and trying to become a cellist playing the cello and then a human living my life, I should start combining them. And the dinner posture was a turning point in my life as a cellist, as a musician. Bow and the frog, left hand in fourth position. I feel good. Now, how can we do it in other positions? That's becoming a little tricky. So, for instance, body movement. Let's say we have to go to the tip. We feel very comfortable taking the butter from here. We still feel very comfortable to move it here. We start to feel a bit uncomfortable reaching out to our friend and actually giving them the butter. That's where the body movement helps you to keep the dinner posture. So if I draw my bow on a down bow, that's when I start following it because I would like to keep the dinner posture feeling, which means my elbow is as low as it can be. I don't want to do that. You know why? Because what do I do else in life like this? Absolutely nothing but playing the cello. Not good for me. I mean, you can do it yourself. For me, it doesn't work. That's pain. That's unhuman. So I would like to keep the body movement so I can keep that feeling right here. That's the body movement. Yeah? Now, if I play in a high position, let's say I play a C, a low C here, which feels really good, and then I want to go to a high C, like in Schumann fantasy pieces. So what do I do to keep the body movement? Now we're entering the next emoji that's going to help us. It's called the door hinge. Yeah. Now, by now you might think I'm crazy. But if you don't, or if you do, keep with me, because by the end of it, you might <laughs> enjoy the cello more, playing the cello. Door hinge. You know, when you open a door, you never think about it. You know, just open, close, open, close, fine. You live your life. But when you think of that door, if it doesn't have that hinge that is helping it to turn out and inside, out and inside, it cannot be turned. Now, again, I'm asking myself, what is my door hinge when I live my life? Forget about cello. Let's say I'm sitting here and I want to reach out to get the glass of wine that I'm going to use for my dinner or the glass of juice. And I just reach up there. You know, I, just, I just want to take it. You know, I don't even think about it. Watch to reach it. Stop. What do I do with my hips? My hips, not only that I turn to the left side, my hips are becoming a door hinge. They're helping me to go up there. Try to do it without your hips. Like, <laughs> it's really painful. Yeah? So I'm reaching for my glass. Or let's say this left hand, you know, I'm lefty, and there's something right there. There's the nuts or the Doritos, and I'm watching football, and I really want Doritos. So, you know, my cello is not here. Watching football, and Doritos is right there. I want to, want to grab it, yeah? I want to grab it. My hips are helping me. It's not only that my body is turning, I'm also turning my hips. Now, let's think about it. What happens? when we get out of the comfort zone of the dinner posture. Let's say we go down to the first position, which people mistakenly think it's easier than fourth position. You know, I'm reaching for the glass now. I'm reaching for the glass. Now let's say I'm going to a high position. I'm reaching for the Doritos. See, I'm doing it with my hips. It's so easy. Let's say I'm playing my beautiful B flat. Now, I'm going to go down to E flat. Now I'm going to go back to B-flat, Doritos, glass of wine. Yeah, I'm reaching out, reaching in. My door hinge saves me and keeps me in that mode of dinner posture. Okay, so if I play, again, I go back to the Schumann fantasy pieces, first movement, there's this big jump that we all freak out. Mm. Now, I'm going to help the shift with my hips, with the door hinge, turning. Now, turn your hips.
Another example. Now my hips. Yeah, better than triple. It really helps, it saves your life and actually you feel 100% comfortable, joyous, happy. Playing the cello should not have other words like discomfort, tension, pain. No. Music, yeah. There's a lot of discomfort musically, a lot of tension musically, a lot of anger musically. Not physically. Not physically. Okay, so that's the door hinge. Now we finish the four first emojis that helps us to achieve the house. Yeah, we have the tiger. We have the tree that helps us move. We have the dinner posture, and then we have the final one, the door hinge that helps us achieving all of it together. The body movement, getting up and down, being alert. Hinge helps us to achieve all of that. Okay, now we're gonna move to emojis of the left hand. How can we communicate between us cellists in a language that will clarify how to use and how to put the left hand on the cello as if we're not playing cello. And by now you already understand that that's my real goal um, by uh, teaching those emojis is how we can make this part of our body and not the opposite, our body part of the cello. This becomes part of us. So the first emoji for the left hand is the apple. I think most of us love apples. When we're young, we don't want to eat them. Then we're old, we actually like them and know that it's good for us. We eat apples. How do we hold the apple? Have you ever seen or have you ever hold, held an apple like this? No. It's not comfortable to eat like this. Really not comfortable. So we don't squeeze our fingers. We don't collapse our wrist. We don't lift our elbow and eat. We usually hold an apple like this. Now, if I would have a, an imaginary apple, I put it in my hand, big one. I like green apples. I actually like them very uh, hard. So green apple, hard, and then take it away and I throw it. And then I look at my hand. And first what I see is a bit of space between each finger. You never hold an apple like this. There's always a bit of a space. There's also inside, like you hold a tennis ball or the apple, there's roundness to your hand, which we're gonna talk about now a lot. But that apple posture is the number one posture we should aim for when we play. Now, a lot of people say, yes, but when I play Dvozhak, when I play something loud, of course I get so excited. But then I always clarify to them, guys, you're not making sound with the left hand. You're decorating sound with the left hand. You create it with a bow. So you can do whatever you want here. It's not going to make sound. See, if I put my finger here and I try to play really loud, does it mean I have to press? I mean, there's no sound. So how about not doing any of it? How about just hanging and achieving an apple structure for my hand? Now, do I want to play soft? Sure, I can play soft. That's a bow arm. So I'm just hanging now in what I call a pianissimo touch. Okay, I touch the string pianissimo. I don't even touch the fingerboard. Now I play pianissimo in the bow. But now I would like to play fortissimo in the bow. Now I want to help with this body movement. Great, that's fortissimo. I stayed pianissimo here. There's absolutely no connection between the two hands. This is one instrument, this is another instrument. This instrument is holding an apple at all time. Okay, so that's the apple. Now we're gonna go to an, a, a very favorite emoji of mine, one that I'm very scared of, I have to say, and it's called the cobra. Everybody knows the snake cobra. I'm scared of snakes in general, especially cobra. I've never seen one, I don't wanna see one, but the cobra kills you very differently than other snakes. It kills you very proudly. Cobra will lift the head up and then hit you and kill you. Other snakes will go under and then if you step on them, they'll kill you. Cobra will go up and kill you proudly. Now, why do I say that? Why do I use the cobra? Because when we walk, when we walk, we actually always lift our feet before it goes forward. We lift it up like a cobra, then we put it down and immediately we lift the next foot up and we put it down. Now, if we run, like if you run in the Olympics, you never run like this. You always lift like a deer, yeah, when you run fast. 
We only walk like this, I find, if we step into a dark room or a place we don't know and we just don't know where we are, so we walk like this. So let's put it into cello um, playing. If these are my feet, okay, and I would like to walk on the cello. If I walk up on the cello, okay, I'm walking upwards from, let's say I'm walking from E on A string to G. I need to do something with my fourth finger. I can keep it always low, like I'm in the dark and I don't know where I am, or I can proudly lift it up within the apple structure and then hit my target gently by putting it down and then I lift the previous finger and I start walking on the cello. I lift before I put it down, I put it down, lift the previous finger and I move on. That's the cobra. The cobra is approaching an upper note. Next emoji is guitar plucking. Now, why guitar plucking? This was an emoji that I had to look for for a while because when we go backwards on the cello, we are now learning how to walk, how to move that apple structure up and down freely. So we know that going upward, we're going to lift it. But going backwards, 99% of cellists will do the same. They'll lift it up. Let's say I play the swan, which we all know. And I start with a G. Then I want to go to F sharp. Many of us will do this. Just lift it up. Now look at my hand if I take it away from the cello. Never eat an apple like this. Never hold the phone like this. Never do anything like it but playing the cello. So if you lift your finger up, you create this tension. What one can see with Casals a lot, with Fournier, with Bernard Greenhouse, with great cellists of the past, with Starker, is a gentle pizzicato on the way back. So I lift on the way up and I pizz on the way back. Yeah? Gently. I just take the finger and I send it back home to its apple posture position. Look. Here it is, nothing. So if I play this one, now I'm going to F sharp, I pitz. If I play something that goes from C to G, I do a cobra. So I'm using a cobra to go up and a pitz to go down. There are many exercises to do that. There's one wonderful one by Starker in his left hand method technique book. So I call it walking freely on the cello. Pits, lift, pits. And so on and so on. You can just walk up and down the cello. So we lift on the way up with a cobra and we gently pits on the way back. Now we move to the next emoji, which is the slide. We all got, went on a slide in our life, and whoever uh, from us, that our parents, and have kids, you go to the playground, and your kids immediately run to the slide. Now when you look at them, and you see your successful kids on the slide, not just any kid that just sort of going down, you see that they put their posture, their body, actually like a tiger. I mean, you lean a little bit forward, allowing gravitation to take you down. Now, of course, when I take my kids there, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, the slide looks exactly like my fingerboard. This is not my decision. History has decided for us that the cello, the fingerboard would go down like this and not like a pianist, you know, where it's straight. Our instrument face downward, which is actually very natural, not like violin, not like flute, not like piano. We faced we face down the, the same way as a slide, the same way as nature. So if you put your hand in the right way on the slide, it will slide down easily. Now what is that right way? I find that the slide, if, it's, uh, if we want to achieve it, what we need to think is that I'm going into our, my, our next emoji, which is the nails. Where should we place our nails, uh, angle-wise, in order to make our hand the best posture to join gravitation. So if your nails are facing you, your face, so sort of straight, it's much harder to slide down on the slide. 
but if your nails are always facing the bridge. Nails are always facing the bridge when you play the cello. That's a very starker thing, Piatigorsky thing. I mean, I've heard it. I did not invent it. But it's so helpful to have the nails facing the bridge. Then it's so easy to slide on the slide, which is your fingerboard. And it's so easy with the help of your door hinge to go backwards, upwards, backwards, upwards. Yeah? We just go on the slide freely, and I repeat, freely. No any movement. It's like solar energy. You put your finger the right way. Or... Now, you see my nail is facing the bridge, and guess what? With the help of the door hinge, I can just, like going to the, going to the playground. I'm just sliding up. Yeah, this shift. So easy if I place my nail to the bridge. So, so far we had the apple, we had the cobra, we had the gentle pits, we had the slide, yeah, and we have the nails. Now, we're going to talk about strawberries. I love strawberries. In fact, all those emojis are part of my life. I deal with them all the time, so I just brought them into the cello. And I have to tell you guys, it has been magical to see how my students at Peabody, how they relate to those emojis and how they change their playing. Just referring to them, it becomes so natural. And then they can express the music so beautifully and so easily. So, we're going into the strawberry. Why strawberry? I actually love, love, love strawberries. Now, when you eat a strawberry, you don't just take your mouth and, and, and grab it. You always grab a strawberry and then you eat it, yeah? So, when you grab the strawberry, usually our strongest fingers are the thumb and the second fingers, also the two that we use more. You don't grab a strawberry with your pinky and your, and your thumb or the fourth finger or the, the first and thumb, maybe, sometimes. But it's usually just, just do this. Now, if you, let's imagine, or even at home, put a strawberry between your thumb and second finger. You just hold it and marvel it. And then think about the feeling you have when you hold it. You don't want to squish it so you don't press, but you don't want to let it go, so you hold it. Now imagine that instead of a strawberry, we have the neck of the cello. We have that feeling of strawberry, take it out. Now, we place the thumb under our second finger, and we tilt, as I just said with the emoji of the nails, we tilt the nails to the bridge. And we hold an imaginary strawberry. We don't press it. I think the biggest problem we have with left hand is pressing the thumb to the neck. We do not put the string down by pressing the thumb. We put the string down by hanging with the upper finger. So in order to do it, in order to hang on the top finger, and not to do anything to the neck. Imagining a strawberry is wonderful. It's a wonderful feeling. Now, I want to tell you a secret, and please don't tell anybody, but this is one of my cello secrets. In order to get that sensation, there are wonderful exercises to do. One of them is to pick a melody and play it with harmonics. Why harmonics? Because harmonics forces you to be in that strawberry mode. If you play... Now that the Elgar Concerto played in harmonics. Yeah, actually, I have to tell you, you can find out the whole melody of the Elgar and you can play it, it's a wonderful exercise. Now, why it's so wonderful? Because when I place this note, which is, sounds like F sharp, but I'm actually placing it on the B, on the D string, as harmonic, I'm actually having that wonderful sensation of holding a strawberry. Because I'm not pressing the thumb and I'm not pressing the fourth finger. Now, if I would take this exercise a bit further, and I would ask you guys to do what I do and what, what I not ask, force my students to do, play four bows on this uh, first harmonic. Each bow feels that you're actually going into the string more, but at the same time, you're almost, and I'm saying almost, almost keeping the harmonic feeling. You just, instead of hanging lightly, you hang a bit 
heavily on it. So another example would be, you know, if you are holding a fence, you know, between your house and a neighbor's house, you're holding it and then you hear some noise in your neighbor's house and you just want to see what it is, but you don't want them to see you. You do this, just, that's it. You just slightly hang a little more. You don't do this and break the, the fence and they see you. So imagine that you're holding the fence for the harmonic, holding the fence. Now, you saw some, something there and you want to make sure they don't see you, but you see it. That's it. Now, guys, if you take a, a piece of paper and you slide it under my D-string, I'm not putting it down to the, to the fingerboard. So my relationship while achieving the, the strawberry between my upper finger and the neck of the cello is a relationship entirely to the string, not to the fingerboard. Think about it. So now I'm going to show you this exercise. I'm going to play four bows. Now each one will be more into the string with a bow, but almost the same with the left hand. See, I can still keep my apple. I'm feeling the strawberry. I'm tilting towards the bridge with my nails. And guess what? I created sound. I'm playing here nothing. But here, I create the sound. Now, do I want more? Fine. Do I want less? It's not connected to the left hand. It's a bow. So don't tell anybody, but try to use it. Now, you can do this exercise. You play the harmonic. Two, three, four. Harmonic. At the end of it, you feel, oh my God, all that tension I had in my hand for years and years. Of course you get tendonitis. It's not because you do something wrong, it's because you're pressing. Our biggest enemy is this muscle. Here and here, we'll get, it. We'll get to it with the bow arm, but now we're here. If you press this muscle, you create all sorts of problems. So the strawberry is crucial, crucial. Okay, now we're gonna talk about shifting. How to shift. We talked about how to go to walk upwards, how to walk backwards. Now we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about how to jump. Because many times on the cello we have to jump. We have to jump from here to here. It's not just walking up, it's to jump upwards or to jump backwards. So the emojis of the shift, there are three elements of the shift, I call them, and there are three emojis here. Number one is motion, and it's the most important one. So I would like you to imagine that there's an imaginary pencil stuck to your elbow, okay? And there's an imaginary piece of paper right here. And let's say, let's pick again the C and the G. Now, when we play the C, we make sure that we have the strawberry, nails to the bridge, apple posture. Now we are going to draw an imaginary circle with our imaginary pencil and imaginary piece of paper we're going to draw it. We will start the note below the note that we play with the elbow, and we will end up that imaginary circle on the arrival note. Okay, that's the motion. The motion is below the note that you play, arriving on the higher note. Now, going backwards, it's the same motion, but backwards. We go below the note that we play, which is G in this case, and we shift our way back into C. That's element number one, the most important element. Number two is the guided finger, or these days you can call it the ways, the GPS. <laughs> um, that finger that you have on the cello, in this case the C, has to go somewhere. Many of us, when I ask students, you know, so what do you do when you shift? So basically they say, you know, I'm aiming for that note, I feel it with my fourth finger, and, and they, they just don't say it, but they mean it, and I pray to God that I'll get there. You know, but what I want you to feel is that you're actually guiding yourself with what I call the guided finger, which is the finger that is on the cello at the beginning of the shift. You're guiding yourself to the new position. So we add the motion, to the guided finger. In this case, it's Do or C going through a motion into F. Now, once I'm in F, 
It's very easy. What is the third element? I think by now you can know. It's the cobra. So once I get to the position or to the street, if it's a GPS, I know to go to the house number, which in this case is G. Okay? So I always ask my students to verbalize the emojis and you can practice. It's fun to verbalize it in a shift. You go from C to G on A string. So we do motion, guided finger, cobra. Now I'm going to hit my target gently. And once I hit the G, I let go of the guided finger. I don't need it anymore. Okay, so motion, guided finger, cobra. Now let's do it faster. Going backwards from G to C, I'm going to shift backwards the motion. My guided finger now is the fourth finger. And my street is D street. House number is C. So I'm going to go backwards. Guided finger now, instead of cobra, I'm using pits. Exactly. Okay, so. Upwards. Backwards. This is exaggerated. Now, of course, musically, I always have to say that we don't always want to do a cobra or a pits because we don't want just that cleanness always. That's not so much like a voice. I mean, it is. It's one option. But sometimes we want to slide into the notes. So then we put the finger, the cobra finger, down earlier. But to practice, I always tell my students, practice it with the three elements. Then make your decision if you want to slide into it or if you want to just do the cobra. Yeah, another example would be the Schumann. Now I'm going to do a cobra just as a practice. C going to street number, that's B, and then guided finger landing on C. Cobra. Of course, musically, if I want to vocalize it, I don't want to do a cobra there. It's not as musical. So eventually I will do and I will slide to it joyfully to make it sound like voice. But when I practice it to learn the distance, I would use the three elements of the shift. There's one more emoji that I forgot to mention in the process of the shape of the hand. And that's actually two. One of is the grapes, bunch of grapes. Why bunch of grapes? Again, I love grapes. You can buy grapes in Whole Foods, in Giants, in Stop and Shop, doesn't matter where it is, in Europe, in Australia. Nature, gravitation will make a grape, bunch of grape looks like a lot going into one. It's hard for nature to stick out a grape. Yeah, it will always look beautifully. Now, if you treat your hand as a bunch of grapes, not just an apple, bunch of grapes, none of your fingers will stick out as a branch of just two or three grapes. It doesn't happen. Yeah? There's always this beauty. So a good exercise to create that sensation is to just joyfully and gently go up and down the cello, imagining that your fingers are just a bunch of grapes. Okay? Now we're moving to the bridge. The bridge, as you can see, the emoji of the bridge is a Golden Gate Bridge. It's a beautiful one. Um, why bridge? Again, going back to piano. When you look at pianists or when you witness a piano lesson, number one for them is do not break the bridge, those knuckles. You see those, sorry, Russian teachers like saying, don't break the bridge, don't do this. Now, if I ask pianists who play with my students, do you ever do that? They're like, oh my God, no, no way. No way, my teacher will never let me. Now, how many of us cellists know that there are always those dark spots on the cello where we break the bridge because we're trying to put the fingers down with the knuckles, which is again, not human. That's not holding an apple. That's not holding a glass and drinking. That's not holding your phone and talking. That's not nothing. But for many of us, it's playing cello and I find it to be a huge problem. So I call this emoji the bridge. Can you, when you play, 
make sure that the bridge, those four knuckles, will be out and proud when you play. Why? Because by placing the bridge out, you can create independence for your fingers. See, if I break the bridge, my fingers cannot do anything. They can be pressed down, but they cannot vibrate, they cannot be flexible, they cannot adjust the intonation. So by placing the bridge out, I can create independence for my fingers. To shift, to pitch, to lift, to decorate, whatever I want to do. If I play an A, see I'm trying to make sure that my bridge is out. Now I'm gonna shift to B flat. Pits, shift, lift, shift, pits, pits, lift, pits, cross, pits, shift. So much fun to do that. Now, of course, I can implant more direction to it, of course. You know, Bloch wants you to make a crescendo, then diminuendo. But I can vibrate now every note freely. Pits. Now I want the low D to sound really juicy and warm. I do it with my lower back. Shift. Yeah, and so on. It's really fun to implement all of them together. So, those are the left hand emojis. And we also have the spider, which is very easy. It's another exercise. Imagine that your palm of your hand is a spider and you have five feet and you walk with it and you just do this on the cello. Another one is the octopus. Imagine that your hand, you don't need the bow for that. Imagine that your hand is an octopus and instead of just being organized and walk like this and having this tension, you become an octopus and you break the rules. You just want to feel, I can do that, I can do grapes, I can do spider, and yes, I can put the bow and do all those things and play the cello. Okay, last emoji. Last emoji for the left hand is the three medals for vibrato. This is something that I was introduced to by one of my great mentors, Boris Pergamenchikov, which I, missed, I miss, miss him a lot. He died a few years ago. Uh, Boris was a great cellist and a great teacher. And once I was playing Brahms' E minor sonata. And... Uh, um, during that uh, piece, as we all know, of course, there's many moments, and one of the moments I remember it was... Uh, And I played it like we all do. I used the third finger on the B, and then I went to the fourth finger on the C. So I played the, see, I placed it, nailed to the bridge, strawberry, apple, the whole bunch of it. And I want to express the C, toddy, more. So I'm playing, and Boris tells me, you know, it sounds beautiful, but it's not more vibrated than the B. And then he asked me something that was a little shocking to me. He said, imagine that th there will be a section in the Olympics and it will be for vibrato. Which finger will get the gold medal? I'm thinking, what? <laughs> vibrato in the Olympics? Well, I play the game and I think, okay, what is my best finger to vibrate? And I think about it and immediately I say the second finger, the middle finger, sorry, but that's, that's a finger. The middle finger is the, one, the strongest one with most meat, most fat, the best one we want. Now he said, okay, but what about silver medal and bronze? And I said, well, for me, silver would be the third and bronze the first. And then he said, what about the fourth finger? I said, well, I, I wouldn't give it a medal. And he said, I totally agree. He said, for some people, silver would be first, bronze would be third, and then vice versa, but nobody would give a medal to the fourth finger. And then he asked me, so why in such a beautiful note, why do you use a finger that has no medal. 
And he said, you know, when we learn to play cello, yes, of course, we learn to play with all the fingers. But when we want to emphasize a note, we could use a gold medal finger for an important note. Or we can do bronze for me. Going into gold. That sounds so much better than, don't you think? And that opened a whole world for me of colors that I, I never expected to be open. So your decisions about fingering, of course, it's always according to the phrase. What's the hierarchy of the note in the phrase? But if you're a really good cellist and you can shift easily, you can move up with a cobra and down with the pits and all that stuff, you can really test yourself with which finger do I want for each note according to that, the importance of that note in the phrase. Do I want to go to... to second? To third? To which finger do I want to go? What can I do with that finger to make it sound to make, it, to make that color a little different. So that's sort of an, an emoji that one can only control when the other ones are in place, but it's a very important one. Now we're gonna move to the right hand emojis. In the right hand emojis I have uh, not as many, but as important, if not more. We start with what I call the chicken wing. Why the chicken wing? Because, you know, I was explaining to one of my students years ago how to use our elbow in what I call a smiling face movement or a banana form or a, a half a moon shape form. And she said, oh, it's like that dance. You know that dance. So she said, it's like a chicken wing. And I said, yes, that's it. From now on, it's going to be called the chicken wing. So when you play violin, you use a lot of this movement. When you play cello, yes, we use this movement too, but we use a lot of the chicken wing movement. That's actually the creator of the sound. Why? Because flowing of air, if you treat your bow as your cello mouth, that's what makes the sound. If this is the mouth, this is inhaling and exhaling air. Yeah? So if I play um, a song that we all know, See, it's all because I'm not using enough elbow. Let's see what happens if I do. See, I do it just with my elbow, just with my elbow. Now, if I play something faster, say I play. Uh, If I place my elbow as if I'm hanging on a chair, which many cellists do, and I just move my arm, I create a robotic sound. If I add to this the chicken wing, I create this beauty, this swing of sound with it. So number one is the chicken wing, okay? Number two, is the cello tongue. And when I ask my students, you know, okay, so you have a chicken wing, you have a creator of sound. You have something that creates the sound. Now, let's say it is your mouth. This is your cello mouth. What part of it is your tongue? So first I ask him to speak without a tongue. I tell them, can you say now good morning while your tongue is placed low on your lower uh, mouth? So that it sounds really funny, sorry, but it sounds like this. Hello, good morning. <laughs> yes, so in order to articulate and to have height of uh, notes when you speak, your tongue is consistently hitting the back of your upper part of your mouth. Now, what is that part in your bow arm? Immediately they say, oh, of course, your fingers. So then I tell them, well, if it's your fingers, why don't you ever move them? So, I mean, so many cellists play, they would move the wrist, they would move the chicken wing, but they would not move the fingers. Where if you learn to move them, you can create clarity without doing anything. It's like solar energy again. So what I do is this, I tell them, okay, put your bow away. Now, imagine you're holding an apple, throw it away. Take this shape, go to your heart. 
take it out. Take your heart out. Take it out. Now look at it and marvel it. It's still alive. What happens to a heart when it's still alive? It's still pumping. Okay, pump your heart. You pump your heart. Now I ask them, imagine that your thumb is the main vein of this heart. The thumb is initiating this pumping. Now I tell them, okay, this is your cello tongue. This is going to be pumped when you play the cello. Now, take your heart, put it back in. You're back alive. Take your bow, place it on the cello, hold it with your left hand. Put your hand on the bow, hold it. Now, start to pump your imaginary heart. Just do this. If you can see, the starting point of this pumping is your thumb. In fact, the most important vein to pump is your thumb. There's a masterclass on YouTube with Starker where he only talks about a student not being able to bend the thumb. It looks straight. If you straighten your thumb and you don't bend it and not be, ha have it flexible, you cannot use your cello tongue. And then I find that many students put their fingers down very low. So I ask them, okay, now look at your hand. And what they realize, what we realize together is that they don't have a tongue. There's not enough space for a tongue. So you cannot pump anything. You cannot have this kind of articulation because your hand is completely planted down. So what I ask them to do is to find a contact point to the stick much lower. So it's around the first joint of our hand. See? First finger, second finger a little lower, fourth finger, that's a dangerous one, many people put it down, fourth finger, maybe around this uh, bent area or decorative area on the bow. And little finger, if I always say, if there would be evolution of cellists, it will disappear. We just don't need it. We need it for focus, yeah. There's a lot of things we can do with it. But if we put it down, we're tilting the weight away from the string, where sound is created. Sound is created through the first finger, so we always tilt it. But now, I can speak clearly by moving the tongue. So, a down bow would be closing, an up bow would be opening. Okay? So, you can take a very simple song. Up bow and down bow. Again, you can do the song. I have a machine here that produces air and it's called the chicken wing. So one exercise is to play this beautiful song we all know. To initiate the movement of the bow with the elbow and to distribute the clarity with your fingers. Another beautiful melody to play. Now, it sounds simple, but try it at home. You'll see that if you're not using your fingers and your elbow, it might sound scratchy, like this, and we don't like that sound. We like a sound that has sort of the letter P and the letter M in it. Pam, 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 pam. Pum, pum. It has a beginning and an end. Okay? Another song, of course, is what I just played before, a Christmas song. So I'm helping my distribution of air with the fingers. Okay? Now, another emoji is the banana bow. Banana bow is the same as chicken wing. It's just a different way to look at it. Sometimes when we have short notes, we don't have time to do this chicken wing. So we actually place our hand, but we can do a banana bow right here with our fingers. So if you play something a little bit faster, like uh, now, Yeah, I'm actually doing a banana bow, 
uh, in order to create beauty in fast notes rather than straight bow. So I'm hitting the string, but I continue the motion. It becomes a banana bow. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the infinitive number. That's another emoji. You can call it number eight lying down or the infinitive number. This is something I got from Larry Lesser and it's extremely useful, I find, with the bow. Uh, Larry was one of my teachers and I'm very thankful for that uh, tip. Um, what Larry taught us, at least that's what I understood and what I'm using daily in my playing, is that, of course, each string is in a different angle. If you play the A string, it will not be the same motion as if you play the C string. Now, if he would say, okay, put your hand here as if you're playing the A string, now just drop it down, and you drop it down. Then you bring it up, drop it down. Now, look at the imaginary lines that you're creating. You're creating a line that actually go out and then down. It's not this. That's really not human to do, yeah? This kind of line. We go out. Now, as I go down on the cello, as I go to this string, that line is going to become smaller and smaller. And on the C string, it would be just pushing it up and down. That's the C string. So let's try to, to put it into bow movement. If I'm on the A string and I play a down bow, my bow will actually, if I uh, find objects in the room, my bow will go to the corner of this room. It will start by going over there. And, oh my God, it feels so comfortable. This feels unnatural, and also the sound is weaker. See, I can't grab the string, but if I go... If I go in that direction, it's so easy to play the note. So if I play... Uh, So, the start of the infinitive number goes out here. But then when we go back, we always push something up a hill. If we do... Now, with my fingers, with my cello tongue, I am turning the direction. Turning the direction of the bow. I am on a down bow. Now I'm going to an up bow. Now the up bow, the tip of my bow is going to tilt towards the public. Okay? So I always feel the resistance of the string, but I feel completely free if I put it into uh, account with the Elgar Concerto. That's a down bow. Now, if you can see, I'm using my body movement as well. Again, the number eight. Out, inside. Now when I play on D string, the number eight becomes smaller. So instead of two big circles, it's like two eggs now. Yeah? string, those two eggs become almost two parallel lines. So the number eight changing its shape. Now on C string, as I said before, because of the angle of the string, we're always pushing up a hill, down and up bow. My bow is always tilted in that direction. If you play Shostakovich concerto, it's always in this direction. Instead of, see, it doesn't really grab the string. It's a different feeling. Really fun to do it. So that Elgar uh, theme is really good one because you can uh, start on A string and practice the number eight. And as you go down on the cello, the number eight becomes smaller and smaller until it ends up being in this direction. Okay. Last emoji for the bow arm. We are almost done with the basic approach to cello playing, which allow us to start making music. 
This is what I call the magical sound potion. And when we create sound, I tell my students, imagine you are a witch and you are the witch of sound. And you have to go to the market and you have to buy three ingredients to make sound. Three kinds of herbs. One of them is going to be how much weight you put on the bow. Okay? The other one will be where you're going to locate the bow. And the third one will be what kind of speed you're going to use the bow. So, depending on where you are on the cello, you're going to play around with those three elements. Weight, location, and speed. Now I want to show you an example. If I play a low D on C string, I'm using the four fundamentals, bouncing lower back, elbows, body movements and breathing. It sounds pretty good and I'm hardly moving my bow. This is like a singer singing a low note, not using much air. Now, if you ask a singer to sing a high note, let's see what happens. I'm going to play the same D here on the cello. I'm going to use the same speed, same weight, and the same location, which was sort of in the middle between the bridge and the fingerboard. What is going to happen? Get ready, close your ears. See, the same speed that I used here on A string. You want the same quality? Ten times faster. And guess what? When you're a singer, if you sing ta, ta, or ma, ta, you need much more air. Same rules goes to the cello. So, the higher we go, the more speed we need. If we would play the Elgar Concerto in a different key, and the main theme would have been here... It would be that slow, but luckily, I would say, it's on the A string, and we have to use much more bow. If I would use the same amount of bow, it would sound... Not good. That's only about speed. Not to mention, of course, the number eight and the differentiality of it when we do it on different strings. So, that's the speed. The location. You know, we always think that if we go close to the bridge, it's going to be scratchy. No. It's about the combination between the three. So, one can play really soft. Look where my bow is. See, my bow is actually much closer to the bridge than it is to the fingerboard. So, I can play close to the bridge on A string and in piano and create beautiful sound just by placing the right amount of weight on it. If I press, of course, it's ugly, but if I control my weight, have the right angle and the right speed, I can play really soft. I can also play really loud and look, I'm in the same spot, but I'm going to use different speed. That, that's a different sound, okay? Different speed. So those are the three elements to create sound. How much weight we put on the bow, the location, and the speed. As you, can, as you see, there's nothing to do with left hand in that, in that element. Our last two emojis are connected both to right hand and to left hand. First one, I love that one, is the jellyfish. We all hate jellyfish. I come from Israel, where the Mediterranean, of course, we go to the ocean a lot. Uh, here I find that people in the East Coast, at least, they go to the ocean to see the ocean, because it's too cold. In Israel, you go to the ocean, you actually go in the ocean, <laughs> and you swim, and we love it but we don't like it when there's attack of jellyfish. And that happens every summer at some point. Uh, jellyfish is something that has no bones and no joints, just nothing. So I think that jellyfish is what connects our hands to the cello. Here and I explain why. 
in the bow arm, first of all. We have, as we discussed, we have the creator of sound, which is the elbow. We have the enunciator of sound, which is our tongue, the cello tongue. And we have the jellyfish, which is the wrist and the palm, which is the reactor to the sound. It doesn't create anything. It reacts. You see, if I move the creator, the chicken wing, my reactor is reacting and my enunciator can enunciate. Okay? So I'm moving only my elbow and I, I'm uh, declaring, you know, the articulation with my fingers. I don't stiffen my jellyfish because jellyfish has no bones in it. Yeah, and I don't also move it. I react with it. Okay? And that creates really um, comfort. You can do two and two like this. If you do... Uh That's not easy to do. You can try to do it at home. Two, 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 two. I'm doing it with a chicken wing motion and with fingers and I'm reacting with a jellyfish. Of course, if you play something like a... Yeah, if you play that, you cannot do it. You cannot create the motion with a jellyfish. You can place a jellyfish, be free, that's the main point, and let the two other parts do the job. Okay? Now, the jellyfish here is the same thing. The jellyfish is your wrist. It's a connection between your elbow planted down and the bridge. That's it. The bridge is connecting, connected to the fingers that become independent. But what connects the bridge to the elbow is a jellyfish. And that jellyfish is very important to keep free and loose, like when you drink a glass of water. You don't squeeze the jellyfish. You let it go. So a jellyfish is a connector, basically. That's what it is. But it's very important to feel it. So look online on what jellyfish looks like and try to create that feeling with your wrist when you play. Last one is the brain waves. And I find the brain waves to be something extremely useful when teaching students to play fast. It's a struggle for many of us, of course. But when we try to play fast, we always work on it very slow. So let's say we have a passage that goes... Uh... Now, we do this passage and we're going to play it slow because we want to learn the notes. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something, that's not going to help because playing so slow is a different kind of playing. It's the same as if you drive a car. When you drive on the highway slow and you take a turn, you're going to really turn the wheel. If you drive 80 miles per hour, when there's no police, or 90, turning that same turn, you have to do just this, whoop, and you're turning. So the faster you go, the less movement you do. So what we want to do is to teach our brain short segments to think in. Brain obviously cannot think so many notes at once, but if you play it fast, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use two accents. So the brain wave will be the beginning of that wave and then going into the next wave. There are two of them here. One, yeah, and then the next one. So there are two. Listen to the two waves. I'm doing them with accents. Okay? Now, as I practice it, I can release the tension from the waves and it becomes just one phrase. But when I practice... Now, let's do three waves. That's the first one. Second wave. Third wave. And finish. One, two, three. That's two. Now three. Okay? So that can be done on all the strings. Two waves, three waves. That's it. Easy. Now, my brain doesn't think about every note. It thinks in waves. One, two, three. So if you apply to the pieces you play and you choose points of interest as waves, it becomes easy for your brains to incorporate many notes when you play fast. I hope this helps and uh, 
that's it. That's my, my emojis and house, cello house. Take care.